Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's quite scary up here, particularly for a Sun journalist, so uh, please be kind. I just want to start off, really, by explaining how I first became involved with this subject and subsequently so passionate about it. Um, in 2009, I knew very little about human trafficking. Probably, like most people, it was a very loose term that was bandied around. And even though at that stage I was travelling around the world with my job, I still really hadn't encountered it first-hand. But that all changed with a trip to Nepal with Joanna Lumley. She asked me to go with her, um, with a number of other journalists from other papers on Fleet Street, to cover the Gurkha justice campaign. She was trying to achieve equal rights in pensions, I'm sure you remember. And we had a wonderful time going all over Nepal in a very scary plane. And then finally, back to Kathmandu. And right at the end of our trip, Joanna asked if anyone would be interested in going to a refuge for trafficked women and their children. She had heard about it from her friend Prince Charles, who had been to visit on a subsequent trip and donated some of his paintings, and she was desperate to go and find out. Now, I have to dob in some of my colleagues here, most of whom were male, and say that at this stage, the trip for the Gurkhas had finished, and they were propping up the bar. But I agreed to go with Jo and, um, and take a look, and immediately I could see that this place was very, very special. A small refuge in the middle of Kathmandu and just lots of women and children buzzing around, looking very content and, and happy considering what they'd been through. And I immediately wanted to, to help and offered to raise money and raise awareness of the work that was going on there. And of course, for journalists, the best way to do that is to find a case study. So I asked the lady who ran the refuge if she would provide me with someone who could best sum up the experience of, in this instance, sex trafficking. And uh, within minutes, this lady appeared before me on the lawn with her child. And I'll put up the first picture here. This is Radhika with her little boy, Rohan. And immediately, you can see from this picture, there was a very, very special bond between this, this woman and her little boy. And I could tell without even having begun the conversation that they'd been through something quite unique to have that special bond. And with the translator's help, she set about telling me her story of trafficking. And what spilled out was so extraordinary and so harrowing that it, it led to, to other things. But I'll just briefly praise her story because it, it, it is so extraordinary. So Radhika grew up, like many trafficking victims, in a small rural community. It was outside of Kathmandu. And a family debt incurred by her sister's marriage dowry meant that she had to venture into the city to sell vegetables. She was just 14 when this happened. Crucially, she hadn't finished her schooling, something that I also find is very common among trafficking victims. Knowledge is power, and Radhika had neither. So there she was, 14 years old, selling vegetables on the side of the road in Kathmandu. And before long, a man called Lama befriended her in the market. He was coming to her every day, and uh, really, you know, making a friend of himself. A classic grooming situation in, in a trafficking uh, case. And um, eventually, he said to her, listen, you don't want to be selling vegetables on the side of the road. This is ridiculous. You know, you're a pretty girl, and I can see that, you know, you're very capable. So I'll find you a better job. I've got you a job as a housekeeper. <coughs> And of course, Radhika is delighted. You know, she thinks she's bettering herself in the world. So she takes this job as a housekeeper. And um, the family treat her very kindly. They buy her clothes, they give her food, and, and she thinks she's hit the jackpot. Before long, they tell her that they'd like to take her on holiday with them. She's become now, by all intents and purposes, a nanny as well as a housekeeper. So she boards a train, and um, they say that they're going on holiday to India. They give her a drink of Coke, as she doesn't know at the time, but it's laced with very powerful sedatives. So she drinks the Coke, and the next thing she knows, she wakes up in a hospital in Chennai, formerly Madras, and she has a scar measuring 12 inches on her left abdomen. This was where her kidney has been taken. So actually, she wasn't a housekeeper at all. She was there as a kidney donor for the head of the household, a, a, a very wealthy Nepalese woman. Um, but worse was still to come. Now she realised she was in the grip of a very ruthless trafficking gang, trading in organs and prostitution. Before long, her trafficker appeared again in the hospital and told her that she was going to be forced into an arranged marriage. 
Marrying her off within the gang would con retain control and enable the criminals, very cleverly, to cash in on the money that she had received for the kidney. It was £1,500. And soon after that marriage, um, in 2004, she was, gave birth to a little boy, Rohan, who you see here and her husband disappeared. Now the gang members intervened again. They could obviously see that, you know, Radhika is a, a pretty girl and um, she was going to be a high prize for them to keep within the gang. And this time they trafficked her through brothels in Assam, Kolkata, New Delhi and Pune over a three year period. And the price tag for full sex for Radhika was approximately, when you do the conversion, £2.89 per client. Now, this was the bit that I'm going to just keep flicking through. Um, I subsequently wrote a, a book about Radhika and, and donated the royalties to her. So this is, I'm praising really what, what, what is in this book. Um, what moved me so much about this story, and, and I knew nothing about this side of, of trafficking, was the way that Rohan, her little boy, was treated. The gang members um, very cleverly remove the child from the woman in, at the point of entry into the brothel. And they're placed in something called a brothel creche. Anurada Koirula, the lady who runs the refuge in Kathmandu, explained it to me like this. She said, when a mother is trafficked with a child, the brothel, brothel owners don't want the mother to be disturbed, obviously, so they immediately separate them. The so-called crashes are usually near the brothels, but the mothers don't know this. And typically, there are two women looking after 30 children. The rooms are small, dirty and dingy, and the children are fed a basic diet of rice and a few vegetables. They have nothing to play with and sleep next to one another on small, filthy mats. The crash supervisors, who are of course part of the trafficking gangs, burn the children's tongues and genitals. The idea is to make the child so subdued and ill, he or she no longer cries for its mother. And Radhika described that moment herself. She said, to take Rohan was the equivalent of ripping out my heart. I wanted to run away to end my life then and there, but I wasn't going anywhere without Rohan. What better way of enslaving a mother? So these are really the lengths of, of cruelty and depravity that these, these gangs are going to. Eventually, and incredibly, with the help of some other prostitutes, Rad and Ro Radhika and Rohan dramatically escaped from the brothel in Pune and found their way home. Um, the reaction at Radhika's local police station in Kathmandu wasn't impressive. What do you expect if you disappear with a total stranger in the middle of the night, you foolish woman, was the gist of it. But in 2008, they entered Mighty Nepal, the refuge where I discovered them. And the legal department there, which is very impressive, helped Radhika to secure a number of convictions against her traffickers. And the ringleader was sentenced to 18 years. So I guess if they can do it there, then we can do it here. Um, I came home completely shell-shocked and ashamed that such a heinous crime had bypassed my world completely. And I wrote this book and began to delve past the civilised veneer of the UK society, or so I thought, to see how far trafficking had spread its tentacles here. And what I found shocked and saddened me. Um, I'll just run through a couple more pictures of Radhika and Rohan here. So uh, you can see that they have a really lovely relationship. Um, and this is Radhika with her father. Now, because in the arranged marriage, Radhika was forced to marry beneath her caste, she is no longer allowed inside her family home in, in Kathmandu. So it's like a, a, so many rejections on so many levels culturally for these people that we don't even know or think about often. This is Radhika's uh, grandmother, who's quite a, a scary character, 103 years old now, and um, she dictates that, that Radhika will not be allowed inside the home as head of the family. Um, this is the family home outside of Kathmandu. That's Radhika with her mother. Um, so you can see a very rural environment and for someone that hasn't finished schooling, so it's such easy prey to fall into the hands of traffickers. Okay, now when I got back to the UK, I, I developed a very trusting working relationship um, with the Met, and um, in particular someone called Detective Inspector Kevin Highland. He would tell me about cases coming to court. I would go along and cover them, and then return to him and ask him for help in telling the backstory. And that often meant marrying up with police forces in the, the country of origin of, of the crime. And obviously on his part initially, that involved a lot of trust, um, and he was taking a risk. But I'd like to think that 
that he would think that it, it paid off. Crucially, I allowed him to read my articles before publication. And I know that's quite unusual amongst journalists, but I was so passionate about the subject that I wanted to make sure that I had everything completely accurate. And crucially, that the victims, his victims, were kept safe so that all of the names, the relevant names were changed, pictures were pixelated, and that we would proceed on that basis. Because, of course, the overall impetus for both of us was to get this crime out there for people to know it was happening and, and you know hopefully for, for traffickers to read that we were onto their case as well um, and he alerted me to another heart-rending case this time domestic servitude a little six-year-old Romanian girl who I called Eleanor in my article and she'd been brought to the UK and kept as a slave for a year inside this house in Wood Green in London people were living in this street next door to this family and they had no idea that there was a little slave inside this house she never went to school and she rarely saw daylight um, she was discovered in 2011. I'll never forget the police officer saying to me that all he could focus on was her feet, the dirt that was ingrained into her feet and her legs because she had never worn a pair of shoes. And um, he said... Sorry, the judge, actually, in this case, said she was like a little slave looking after the youngest children in the Romanian family. She was changing nappies, feeding them and making up their bottles and feeding the animals. She would be hit on the head, shouted and sworn at. The other children would beat her like she was a carpet. She was never allowed to do a day of school. Her captors, a lady called Alexandra Wee, her husband Remus and sons Marion and Florin were tried and convicted of trafficking Eleanor with the intention of exploiting her and they were jailed for 40 years between them recently. Um, they were also convicted of trafficking a 53-year-old man called Christian to Britain and brutally exploiting him. He was living in a shed at the back of this house and was basically going robbing scrap metal for the family while this little girl, who incidentally they had effectively bought off of a very vulnerable woman back in Romania, um, and uh, while she was inside. And he eventually raised the alarm on behalf of this little girl. And I think it's really significant to say that he went to the local police station in Wood Green and he came across a WPC, a lady called Laura Coates. He spoke no English and all he could do was write SOS on a piece of paper and hand it to this WPC. But she treated him with such kindness, took a statement from him, arranged for bed and breakfasts through social services. And that intervention was crucial in gaining his trust. And later on, he became a crucial witness, I'm sure largely because of his first impressions of the police force. He later referred to her as an angel. And... Um, Later on, with the full cooperation of the Met, I went back to Romania to do the backstory uh, on this case to a place called Rosieri de Vedi, which is where this family were, for, were from, and saw with my own eyes the proceeds of, of the crimes, the mansion that they were building um, off the back of this, you know, what appears like a small operation, but actually many thousands of pounds, benefit fraud, scrap metal, and uh, of course getting this little girl to do all their work for him. I also eventually met Christian, the man that was living in the back of the house in the shed, and I saw his human trafficking scars, the cigarette burns, the raised scar from a knife on his arm, the smashed skull, and he was living at that point very miserably in a bedsit on the south coast, unable to return to Romania and, and function there properly, and really unable to function here, trapped in this awful sort of purgatory. Um, it was depressing meeting him, but also uplifting in the sense that I really felt I had met a true hero um, for what he'd done for this little girl, risked everything, he risked his life. And I'll never forget him producing a prized possession from his pocket. It was a picture of, that the little girl, Eleanor, had drawn for him, showing a little girl with a happy face, and the words simply said, thank you for helping me. And this story, um, I work full-time for The Sun, but actually this story was eventually placed in the Sunday Times magazine because we felt it needed a slightly bigger canvas and this was how it played out in the Sunday Times magazine so this was the picture that the little girl drew for Christian and uh, it was called a Cinderella story because the judge in the case dubbed this little girl Romanian Cinderella and uh, you can see the, uh, the picture there, that's inside the, the shed where um, Christian was living, the mansion is the other picture that the family were building with the proceeds of the crime 
this was the police officer I interviewed in, in Romania with the help of the Met. And uh, a few other pictures there. And that's the note, the very poignant note that uh, Eleanor wrote for Christian. OK, and I'm just going to... I'm in the town uh, oh, of Chesky. Sorry, can I just go there? Right, OK, um, so um, I'll move on to the, the next story. This again was... Um, I'm sorry I'm rattling through this, but I'm aware of the time. So um, another story that uh, I did with the, the help of um, the, the Met, and this time also with the involvement of a very interesting character, a man called Andrew Forrest. Uh, now, he was uh, a jackaroo in Australia and eventually became a billionaire through mining. And he's now a philanthropist who has joined Bill Gates' philanthropy club and um, pledged to give away half of his wealth during his lifetime, um, fortunately for anyone interested in it, to the anti-trafficking cause. And amazingly, um, he became very passionate about anti-trafficking because his daughter did a gap year in Nepal and stumbled across the very same refuge where I met Radhika. So we initially had uh, a rapport and uh, we set up a meeting and he asked specifically if I would push to do an anti-slavery campaign in the sun. He's a very astute man and uh, he said people need to read what you're writing about and there is no better canvas obviously than the, the paper that is read by the most people in the UK. So um, we set about trying to produce a series for The Sun and another case popped up from the Met and this time it involved a gang of traffickers who were luring girls out of the Czech Republic to work in UK brothels. A very familiar story sadly um, but these girls were being kept in a holding pen rather macabrely um, and in a house that had been lived in by Fred West in Gloucestershire. I'm sure many of you have heard of the story. Two of the gang members were eventually jailed last May for nine years. They were convicted for trafficking for sexual exploitation and another two got 11 years. So another you know, great case for the Met to be able to highlight another great uh, conviction. So I travelled to Prague and out further to a town called Cheska Lipa to meet Nicola, age 24, one of the victims. She wasn't stupid, but she was vulnerable. The product of a broken home, she'd been made redundant from her car factory job and was hitching a lift home with a friend when a man called Desida Herak came cruising towards her in his gold Mercedes before stopping to offer her a lift. He told her, things are great in the UK, I can find you a job as a waitress. A familiar story which those of us involved in trafficking have all heard before, but for her it was the start of what she thought was a great life but ended in a nightmare. And this was a short video that I made that went on The, the Sun online about the case, so I'll play this rather than uh, drone on anymore. That's journalists multitasking these days. <laughs> Um, and this was the uh, print article that appeared uh, alongside this in The Sun and actually made the front page of The Sun, which uh, was uh, a, a massive breakthrough to have a subject like this on the front page of a tabloid newspaper. Um, this kind of issue, sadly, doesn't sell papers, but it's incredibly important that people read papers when these articles are in them. Um, next, my work took me to the north of England, to Manchester, and this story formed uh, part of, of the series that we collaborated with uh, Andrew Forrest to do. And uh, this was, again, another little girl that was kept in a cellar. And uh, this, she was deaf and mute. I referred to her in my article as Shamim. Uh, again, a notorious case. I'm sure uh, lots of you have read about it, heard about it, even involved in it. Um, she was only 10 when she was dumped in this dank cellar in Eccles in Manchester and forced to work packing fake goods for her captor's business. She was only brought out to cook, clean and iron for Ilias and Talat Ashar, who were regarded as pillars of their local community. I think what's interesting is when I actually went to this house, went to this community, one of the neighbours came out and said, oh, what are you doing? And I introduced myself and told her why I was there. And uh, she said, it's extraordinary to think that we had a slave in our midst. We would never have known, because they're actually bringing this girl out from time to time to clean people's cars and things like this, but just said that she was sort of like their adopted niece uh, and everyone bought the story. And I think that's another very poignant message. You know, we, we all have slaves in our midst. OK, and so just finally, um, this is an incredible book, if any of you have time for a bit of uh, bedtime reading. It's called Bury the Chains by Adam Hochschild. And it tells the story of the British struggle to abolish slavery. In the opening paragraphs, Hochschild, Hochschild states, we must picture a world in which the vast majority of people are prisoners. 
Most of them have known no other way of life. They are not free to live or go where they want. They earn no money from their labor. Their work often lasts 12 or 14 hours a day. Many are subject to cruel whippings or other punishments if they do not work hard enough. They die young. They are not chained or bound most of the time, but they are in bondage, part of a global economy based on forced labor. Now he's referring to our world two centuries ago. But those of you familiar with modern slavery will know it sounds just the same as the plight of those caught up in this crime today. It is re-emerging as one of the biggest crimes of the 21st century. The Walk Free Foundation, headed up by this billionaire Andrew Forrest, has measured it for the very first time in something called the Global Slavery Index. He estimates the number of UK slaves at approximately 4,600, but the Labour MP Frank Field says the figure could be as high as 10,000. Poverty, limited opportunities at home, lack of education, unstable social and political conditions, economic imbalances and war are the driving forces that contribute to the trafficking of victims. None of these factors are the victim's fault. The only difference between them and us is the way the dice was rolled at birth. And I, for one, feel very passionately about the basic stark injustice in that statement and certainly want to keep doing all I can to give these people voices in the media. I hope that you will also hear their voices if they come to your police stations. Thank you. Sharon, thank you very much indeed. What, uh, what moving stories. Uh, we have a slight change uh, to our programme uh, now, ladies and gentlemen. Sue Scott uh, from Avon and Somerset unfortunately cannot be with us, but uh, stepping into uh, the breach, we have uh, Detective Inspector uh, Neil Byrne and also uh, Kate Garbers from Unseen. That is a charity that uh, deals with uh, human uh, trafficking issues. So give them both a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Good morning, thank you very much for having us. Um, my name's Kate and I help run a charity called Unseen. Um, just to give you a brief overview, we do direct survivor support via 24-7 safe housing. We also do resettlement support, so when survivors, as we like to call them, um, are granted leave to remain in the UK, we actually help them kind of settle into their communities. Um, and we also do a range of work with um, police forces, um, local and national government, which is kind of why I've ended up here today. Um, so we hope in the next 25 minutes or so, we'll be able to let you know about the multi-agency approach that Avon and Somerset have taken around the issue of slavery. Part of the journey they've been on, and we've been on with them, in terms of ensuring that the work is truly intelligence-led and victim-focused. And we hope that this will assist you as you think about what it is that you need to do in your own force area. Um, I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you, that trafficking and slavery is happening everywhere. No force is immune. And with the new modern slavery bill due to reach royal assent in 2015, and as the issue rises up the political agenda, I believe that you guys are going to be required to show how you're approaching the issue, how you're tackling the issue, the intelligence you've got on it, and how you're then going to support the victims and survivors. So hopefully this will help you with some of that. So just so we're all on the same page, for us, trafficking is the movement of people by means such as force, fraud, coercion or deception with the aim of exploiting them. Um, as we've heard from Sharon, it is in essence modern day slavery. It's the commodification of people for the purpose of making profit. Um, there is a massive spectrum of exploitation. It is complicated, it's complex. There's no need to cross an international border. It happens to anyone, regardless of nationality, gender, and sexuality. Those things are not concerns for traffickers. So it breaks down predominantly into three elements. The act, so what is done, the means, how it's done, and the purpose, why it's done. We currently recognize about five different types of trafficking and slavery in the UK. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but again, they're all currently under disparate legislation. 
it makes it really tricky for you guys when you're trying to work with a potential victim or trying to get a slavery case together and um, you then have to go to CPS and it's all kind of under different bits. So we've currently got the Coroners and Justice Act, we've got the Asylum and Immigration Act and the Sexual Offences Act. With the new modern slavery bill next year, it is hoped that all of that legislation will be pulled into one act, which will hopefully make it a lot easier to get prosecutions, gather evidence and intelligence. So I'll now hand over to Neil. <coughs> Just going to introduce this video that's been um, produced by Unchosen, which is a charitable organisation that is raising awareness in relation to this uh, offence type. Um, it's very thought-provoking and I think it just uh, highlights the issue of keeping an open mind when you're dealing with potential victims of this type of criminality. Sorry about the length of that, that video, but um, I think it clearly illustrates the need for us to consider everybody that we encounter as a potential victim. And I'm sure everybody in the room has, has dealt with um, warrants and, and situations like that, not just for cannabis cultivation, but for um, example, road trading and um, Operation Liberal related offences. So we just need to, for me, the emphasis is about remaining with an open mind at all times. So I'll hand back to Kate now. Um, so this bit, Neil and I are just going to let you know a little bit about where Avon and Somerset have kind of come from with this issue. One, to encourage, um, and two, to kind of show what's possible, I suppose. So Operation Pentameter, um, the original operation that looked at all um, forces and trying to look at predominantly trafficking for sexual exploitation, Avon and Somerset in both operations reported no problems with trafficking, no victims uncovered. Um, so I say that in a way to encourage, because actually where they've got to now um, is far different. So we started with a really low baseline, in effect a blank canvas, because we didn't think we had a problem. Um, and what appeared when we started looking for it, um, Neil is going to go into. But it's fair to say we haven't got it right just yet, but we are making progress and we are going in the right direction, which is fantastic. Again, obviously standing here today with Kate clearly shows the way that we're working together. And one of the main drivers for us is uh, the multi-agency approach and all of us working together and contributing to actually develop our understanding and improve our knowledge um, and learn lessons as we go through this. Uh, we've increased training for all of our officers at every level and that's been um, developed in conjunction with the Unseen Charity. Um, we've also uh, created uh, an anti-trafficking partnership which is uh, co-founded with um, Bristol City Council which Kate will touch on in a little while. Um, but we've got a dedicated force SPOC, we've, part of a, we've got a trafficking working group, um, and for example, we've started in, within the intelligence world um, reviewing all of our intelligence and our, our crime incidents um, that we've got recorded, um, and which changed the emphasis to being purely proactive and victim-focused, to actually identify potential victims and actually look after them and protect them. Uh, and I'll talk about Oper Operation Wander in the next couple of slides. But um, suffice to say, as Kate said, we're not there completely. We're still learning the lessons every day. Um, but we're now tasking officers. We've set a clear intelligence requirement. We're filling our gaps. So we're able to actually understand what's the most significant threat, risk and harm. And um, we're actually in a position now to make in informed ethical decisions um, so that we can actually protect the, mo the most vulnerable. Um, so part of the multi-agency work um, has been an anti-trafficking partnership. Now we decided if we were going to tackle this issue um, initially in our locality and then force-wide, we needed a multi-agency approach. So two years ago, the trafficking partnership was established um, and it was meant to be and is a strategic but also operational partnership based around these five strategic themes. The agencies that are represented, um, we have HMRC, Her Majesty's Prisons, the um, Young Offending Team or Service as they're now known, Children's Services, Health and Safety Executive, Police, GLA, UK VI, UK Border Force, Crown Prosecution Service, Department of Work and Pensions, um, and legal teams from various law firms. So all people that realise that they might either encounter victims of human trafficking in their day-to-day -day work, or actually they might be involved in unpicking some of the larger organised crime networks and the things that go on behind um, the kind of victims that agencies like um, Unseen work with. So we've done a variety of activities over the last two years, um, and we 
we've produced various documents and products for the wider community to use. Um, part of that has been we um, have developed a care pathway for safeguarding adults and safeguarding children that now sits in most agencies across the force area. Um, it sits in their safeguarding policy and just is a really it's simple step-by-step -step flow diagram of if you think you've encountered a victim of trafficking, these are things to look for and this is what you can then do. We've also um, created a coordinator post, so we have someone that coordinates that for us, um, and we have an intelligence email address. It was very much said from especially the NGO sector and some forums in Avon and Somerset that actually for them to give intelligence to the police directly um, posed them problems. However, if the anti-trafficking partnership had an email or a way of getting information in, that they would be happy to do that. So we now have a dedicated email address that the coordinator um, kind of checks. She then completes a five by five on the intelligence that's come in and then we submit it to Avon and Somerset. So we're really trying to work in that multi-agency fashion to fill and plug those gaps. Um, the group is chaired by Bristol City Council, um, Unseen and Avon and Somerset and this year we um, as a main partnership board decided that we needed to have four task and finish groups. Um, to look at the issue in more depth. So we wanted to think about how we as an agency expand, sorry, as a partnership expand across the force area and then share that best practice across the region. We then also um, wanted to look at how we deliver and develop training packages, so baseline modules to make sure that everyone who may encounter a victim knows what to do, knows what to look for and knows how to get intelligence into agencies such as the police that can then do something about it. Um, we then decided that we would look at identifying champions as well within different agencies and that training module would then help the champions um, and then they would be able to feed into the police and finally we had a problem profile group now I think this is um, for me it was my most exciting group because I got to work with the police lots um, and it meant we got to go do fun stuff which was brilliant um, but um, this again might be something that you guys can take away into your own force area so this was a group made up of NCA health and safety DWP Roku gain uh, GLA, Avon and Somerset, Borders and um, Unseen. And we were basically set the task of trying to capture the extent of the issue of slavery in our force area. Um, I thought that kind of was that was what the ATP was meant to do originally and they went, OK, we'll give it to a, a smaller group to go tackle it. Um, so we decided, looking at national trends, that there was an indication that nail bars were potentially places where victims of trafficking and slavery might be being harboured. So each aforementioned agency went away to do their own intelligence gather, to look at their own systems and to see what information we had on nail bars. I think the last bit of intelligence that we had on a nail bar was about 2009 and it wasn't anything to do with trafficking. Um, all the other intel that came up on the Guardian report indicated that there was lots of kind of stuff going on around nail bars but we hadn't recognised any victims, so things were being flagged by officers but not from a victim focus or not from a slavery focus. So we were like there is a massive gap in what we actually know. So we decided as a problem profile group we needed to see if there was a problem and we needed to profile it so we decided we would take it forward. We used force intelligence to do some more work around various nail bars. I think we started with about 167 in the force area, got it down to 16 and then got it down to four that on various indicators and various links that had been found indicated that actually whether it was slavery or whether there was something else going on, different crime types, it would be worth going for a visit. Now we have standard welfare visits in Avon and Somerset to go into brothels and establishments selling sex. So we thought why can't we do the same for nail bars? So then sitting around this multi-agency table, we have issues of, well, they're technically legitimate businesses. They will have customers in there. And unlike in a brothel where you've got a punter who might be slightly more um, shocked at police presence, actually that customer believes they've paid for their nails to be done. So how are we going to kind of walk in into one room and, and deal with potential customers? How are we going to deal with the disruption for business? Will there be complaints at the fact that police have gone in and disrupted someone's business? And then UK borders pipe up with and what about immigration issues? So all of these things in that multi-agency room we had to sit and we had to really struggle with and tease out. To give them their credit, UK Borders said for these first round of visits, why don't we go purely with a victim-focused welfare kind of mindset? If there are issues with immigration, we will go back and sort that out later. 
the learning from that is we came across so many immigration issues that when we do the next set, we are taking immigration with us because we need to do fingerprinting on site and we need to check out who these people are. So, but again, that multi-agency trusting partnership meant to begin with, they were like, you know what? You go do it and let us know if there's a problem. We all learned from that and now they're, they're coming out with us. So from these visits, um, we have basically been able to do enforcement action. We've met with potential victims. We have given people who showed indicators of being in enslaved and trafficked, information about where they can go for help. No one decided to come with us. Victims are incredibly tricky to work with. We walk in on a Monday morning and say, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Would you like some help? And they're like, no, I'm just doing my job. Everything they tell you about their journey to the UK, the fact they're not being paid, the fact they have to live on site, for us is ringing alarm bells of kind of exploitation and enslavement. But they're not in a position to do anything about that right now. So we've been leaving information behind for them. And as a problem profile group now, HMRC, DWP, Border Force and the police have got subsequent investigations going on from the intelligence that has been gathered. So a really successful multi-agency kind of group work to problem profile that risk area. And now um, we've been set the task of moving on to car washes and hotels. So uh, watch this space. Thanks, Kate. <clears throat> as I touched on earlier, there's um, Operation Wanderer um, that was... Um, instigated as a result of the um, profiling my team did um, from the Force Intelligence Bureau, um, identifying up to 62 potential victims when they scanned through the all intelligence and, and crime incidents that we held in force. Um, and as a result of that, we conducted a significant um, day of action to actually protect the vulnerable. Um, and as a result of that, we had a gold-silver command structure, and again, it showed the true multi-agency working at its best, where we had all the partner agencies at the meetings, and there was some real honest and frank discussions in that open environment to actually uh, eradicate any of the issues for that day and any subsequent days. Uh, during the day of action, we uh, recovered, identified and unidentified victims uh, and took them to the reception centre, some of which... Um, said there was no problem and they went on their way and there was others that were um, referred to the national referral mechanism and given traffic status. Uh, the ones that refused to engage, we obviously had in intelligence and information that suggested that they were at risk um, and they were uh, referred to the safeguarding mechanism. However, they didn't meet the vulnerable adult criteria, but we still... Um, began that process with them and they refused to engage and as a result to... Um, actually identify with them the significant risks we thought they were at. They were given threat to life warnings. Um, and as a result of the process, we've, the journey we've been on with Operation Wanderer, we've um, failed to get any prosecutions. But again, it comes back to the victim. And our focus is purely about the victim. It's not about the, uh, the actual criminal conviction at the end of the day. Um, but with that in mind, you have to always think about what other avenues are available to you. So we've got financial investigations ongoing at the moment against the organised crime groups that we've identified involved in this criminality. We're working in partnership now with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, Department of Work and Pensions, Trading Standards. And during this process, we've identified a significant amount of um, car insurance frauds where they've used victim, potential victims' details to uh, make unlawful defrauding claims. Um, and again, as a result of working together, um, as you can see by Kate being here today, we are collaborating all the time. Um, but it is a true multi-agency approach, um, which was clearly shown by the, uh, for example, the media and the synergy between all the agencies, that there was um, no miscommunication and it was, it was one, one voice, as it were. And um, we received significant positive feedback from the communities, which improved the public confidence. As we've developed our presentation, the, the things that we sort of um, picked out that we th we'd like you to take away with you following today's presentation was the primary objective is about the victims and the potential victims and always thinking about safeguarding, but not just as the police, but in partnership with all the other agencies and law enforcement. It's, um, it's critical you keep an open mind, um, as was shown by the, the, the video that I, clip that I played, and there's hundreds of those types of videos out there covering all different crime areas. Um, and again, it's about trying to develop, as we would for domestic abuse, um, victimless prosecutions. Um, it is a significant task and challenge, but again, it's about thinking about that as well at the, the initial stages of your investigation. Uh, and again, it's um, 
we've learned through Operation Wander, it's about being victim focused. It's not about the, the end game, which is the um, detection and the, the solved crime because there's massive issues with building trust and confidence with the victims and they have significant credibility issues when you go and present your cases to the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, and again, it runs on to the next point, which is about all your staff understanding the impact that they, one, their the first contact or any contact they have with any potential victims can be extremely damaging if they get it wrong. And it's just about them thinking about the impact and understanding their role in this. Um, and we've talked about this for uh, quite a uh, length, I would say, is um, one of the sort of strap lines that we've come out with with this um, presentation is about breaking the cycle. It's um, actually trying to intervene and actually to engage with victims and to remove them from the risk that they are at by these organised crime groups. Um, and that's it from me. Thanks very much. Thank you all very much indeed. Fascinating stuff. So, questions or comments? Anyone in the audience, just uh, stick your hand up and please get involved. We've only got about five minutes, but so please, please, if you want to get involved. I mean, one of the things that struck me, uh, Neil, about what you were saying was, I mean, terrific headway and good you've, you've done what you've done, but 62 potential victims, no prosecutions yet. What, what's the response from your bosses when you say, we spent all this time and energy and indeed all this money, but we haven't actually got anybody in the book yet? Oh, the, the response we've had within Avon and Somerset has been really positive because, again, it comes back to one of our primary objectives is protecting the vulnerable and supporting victims, which is this is what we're doing as a result of that operation and other subsequent operations. It's put, the way that we now approach this is from a victim perspective, not forgetting, obviously, the preventative work to try and eradicate the problem at locations, but also deal with offending groups and offenders, but again, that is problematic for this crime type, and that's why you need to look at exploring all other opportunities. The biggest difficulty, uh, uh, Kate, I think, is you know, just breaking this, you know, th this fear, honest, very understandable fear that the victims have. I mean, they live in terror, and I suspect in, in most cases they don't want to talk to even you, let alone the police, because they feel that if they do, their life will be even, even worse. And, and I don't know how you crack that, really. Um, it is a really, really tricky one. I think part of the Problem Profile Group, what we've learned from that is that we're going to task neighbourhood managers um, and we are asking neighbourhood managers in the same way that they go into kind of other places on their patch to go in and chat to people in car washes, chat to people in nail bars um, and just try and build up that rapport and that confidence so that actually when an operation or a welfare visit goes through the door, they've already interacted with the police. Some of those barriers have kind of been taken down, but it is a really tricky it's thing. It's a long haul. Uh, gentlemen, here, introduce yourself, sir, and tell us your point. Uh, good morning, Sean. Wilson met please my question is to Sharon um, I was very moved by your account and um, particularly by the plight of the children in terms as they grow up are they also then reduced into slavery or for organ donations etc or do they manage to um, uh, is there an outer for them um, well, certainly in the case of the uh, Romanian girl that I spoke about, you know, there is a, a relatively happy outcome for her. She was uh, in foster care for a period of time and I believe that that has now led to an adoption situation, although, uh, of course, you know, there will be uh, lots of ongoing issues for that family to work with. But yes, I think, you know, the potential for people to fall back into slavery it is huge. I mean, essentially, you know, they're, they're brainwashed, and particularly if a child is involved and they're, they're brainwashed at that age, then um, that they're, they're going to be doubly vulnerable. And, and from your investigations, Sharon, I mean, the one of the things that intrigues me and it will intrigue everyone is, you know, how do these people get into this country, which are highlighted by the Tilbury case and this different issue slightly, and, and the Somerset case? Mm. I mean, <laughs> is it simply that border staff are just simply? Uh, overworked and, and, and too stretched. I mean, what, what's, the, what's the, general, the, the general pattern of people getting into this country? Um, well, I guess, you know, in, in every case, there are different ways and means. I mean, certainly for the girls coming over from Europe, it's, it's very simple. Sure. You know, they're just coming over on their passport. Um, but with the case, the little girl that was kept in the cellar in Manchester, that was quite an interesting case in, in so far as uh, she came over on a, a forged uh, passport that, that said she was 20 years old. At the time, she was 10. 
Uh, so that was, uh, you know, a, a big, a big missed opportunity there at the at the border control. Um, somebody uh, was seeing a passport that said she was 20 and was seeing a little girl that was 10, but somehow she was waved through. Um, now, obviously, mistakes happen, but that was what happened in that case. Astonishing. Uh, right, uh, gentleman there, Charles Yar, sir. But James Andronoff from West Midlands Police. Um, it's just uh, a question, really. First of all, thank you for a really compelling and interesting presentation from, from all three of you. Um, I'm interested to on how the police lever resources given lots of competing strategic demands. So how has this been prioritised in the force and how have you managed to get some resource in? As a result of the problem profile and the, the significant threat that was posed by to, to the victims that we'd identified, that was prioritised as, as our top operation. And so the resources were allocated and the, the, um, the day of action was basically, it was on a Sunday mm. to maximise our opportunities, understanding the way that the, the organised crime group worked from the development work that we'd undertaken, that Sunday was the optimum day to strike, um, which caused issues because the majority of staff aren't working on Sunday, so we had to cancel everybody's rest days. And there was a, a nearly, I think, up to 500 staff working that day to actually simultaneously execute warrants at... Um, four fixed traveller sites and a number of residential properties within Bristol and Somerset. Um, but again, the, the force had, under, had highlighted it as the number one priority during that tasking process. And I've still got a team of, it's, it's down to five at the moment, working on this job still now, since do last you, November. I mean, you know, do, well, I don't know how, to what extent you talked to other forces and colleagues in other forces yeah. about, about this problem, but what impression do you get of their knowledge and their understanding of the extent of it? Um, there is knowledge out there across the other um, forces because um, I've engaged with some people and so they're in the room as well. So, um, but there are forces that, and again, Avon Somerset was guilty of this a few years ago where we said we haven't got a problem. Mm. And it's not until you actually start to approach it and, and be creative really in the way that you assess the threat that, that's being is, posed. Is that your impression too, Sharon? I mean, when you, when you ring around and you talk, you obviously got a lot of help from the Met and you obviously got some help from Manchester for the case in Eccles, but when you ring around other forces, do you get the impression they're across this? Um, in, in what sense? In the sense, do, do, they, do, they, do they have a knowledge of the extent of the problem in, in, in their community? No, I, I don't think they do, John, and I think it really goes back to what I was saying at the very start. I mean, I, I'm a journalist, I've been operating for The Sun for 14 years, and, and I had no extent of the crime um, until I met this, this first victim. Uh, but I think, you know, there is so much information out there now, particularly regarding the new modern slavery bill. I mean, I just sort of clicked onto the Home Office website uh, before I came here and found this, you know, brilliant document, which everybody can download, Modern Slavery, How the UK is Leading the Fight. Um, just two minutes on a printer and every one of your officers could have this or look at it online. Um, so the information is really there now. It's just a case of, 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 of knowing that it's there, really. Right, and if there's no more questions, uh, time again uh, is beating as I'm a little bit behind schedule, but thank I'm sure you'd like to show your appreciation to our panel. Terrific session, thank you very much.